we kick off our new series this morning, Failure to Feel, and uh, I'm going to hit some things that, honestly, I've really never heard a sermon. Um, I, I don't hear very many sermons on emotions and feelings. I think that it's one of those things that ha- I think that a lot of pastors are afraid to preach because they in themselves don't have the confidence to do it because they're unaware of their own. And I'm not saying I got mine all figured out. Trust me. If you get around my wife, she will tell you. I don't have all my emotions and feelings already figured out. But I believe that it's something that will help you in your journey of faith. And I'm going to tie some things in this morning. If you would, turn your Bibles with me to Genesis chapter 1. And we will kick off uh, the text here. And I'm going to use this to kind of create a foundational spot so that you can understand where we're going and uh, what we'll be in and how important it is for this. So in in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, it says this, Then God said, so this is God's idea, okay? So this is God's idea. He said, Then God said, let us make human beings in our image. Okay, so you right now are made in the image of God, whether you realize it or believe it. Okay, you are made in the image of God to be like us. Can you imagine that you are like God right now? I know that that doesn't even compute with you sometimes, but you are like God. It says, they will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. So God created human beings in his what? His own image, right? In the image of God, he created them. You are like God. Right now, there are, you are an image bearer of Jesus Christ, of God, of the Holy Spirit right now. So let's pray, and we will get started. Father, I thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you that it never returns void. God, I pray that your word would fall in our hearts, that it would transform us, God, from the inside out. Lord, I thank you that we are image bearers, God, that, you were, that we were created to be like you, to, to emulate you, like to, to be like you, to look like you, to live like you. And so, Father, I thank you that you would help us in this morning, in this text, God, help us to live like you. Father, I pray that our lives, God, would... would would so pattern you that, God, we couldn't help but make you famous on the earth this morning. Come on, if you believe that, say amen. Now, you got to be a little bit more rowdy. you got to be a little bit more, you know, it's okay to be shouted. It's 2020. You can start, turn over a new leaf. It's okay. You can, you, can, you can be loud. It's okay. You can talk. But as I was thinking about this, I was thinking about in the image of God, and as we moved into, into emotions, I began to, to, to just think about, you know, over the last, how much how much of us we try to ignore, we try to cut out, we try to, uh, you know, just act like, you know, you got those people who are emotional, they're feelers, you know the feelers, the feelers know the feelers, <laughs> all the feels, and then you got those who are non-feelers, like, it's like, I don't care what, I don't care what I feel, you got those two people, right, and I, and I started thinking about, about this whole aspect of it, and, and over the last couple of years, I mean, over the last year, I had a surgery, and they took out my gallbladder, and I'm doing great. Like, I was just thinking, God, why did you give me a gallbladder if I didn't need it? And so I started thinking about how many of us try to do that with our emotions. Like, we try to cut out our emotions. We try to cut out our feelings. We try to, and I started researching, did you know that you can live with only 45% of your organs? You can survive. Now, not all at once. I mean, if they took 45% of your organs, you're dead. You're going, you're going out, you're done. But if we by week or month by month or year by year, they took an organ, one lung, one kidney. You see what I'm saying? And they took out a gallbladder and an appendix. So, so back years ago, I had my appendix taken out. So then I had my gallbladder. I'm like, Lord, what are you trying to, what are you taking away from me? Like, oh, well, leave me some of you. You said in our likeness, Lord, don't you have these things? And I started thinking about that, the, the reality of that there are 12 organs that is all you need to be able to survive. Twelve organs. And I think a lot of us have this tendency to try to take an emotion. And I want you to know that this morning, an emotion is not an organ. You cannot remove it as much as some of you would like to not be emotional or to be more emotional, that you cannot remove this part of you. It is by design. It is created and you are going to be an emotional being for the rest of your life. Look at somebody say, I know. You know, you've been wanting to say that for the last year and I'm giving you permission to be able to do that now. I know you're emotional, right? That God created us in his likeness. So now, now to bring this into context, what I want to take you to is, is 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. It breaks down 
the whole aspect of who we are, right? We tell, he said he's in our image, but what does that look like? What does in our image look like? 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 says this. Now may the God of peace make you holy in every way. How many of you know in every way means that there must be more than one way? So there is different ways for God to make you holy. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning and this next month, is we're going to talk about God making you holy in areas that you never thought could be holy. And he says this, and he says, and may your whole spirit, that's one aspect, your, your soul, that's another aspect, and your body, that's another aspect. So God is letting us know that just like the Trinity is God, Father, God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, there is three, there is a spirit that you and I live from, that we hear the Holy Spirit from, that we connect and conversate with. There is a soul that helps us determine and dictate what we do with our lives. And how do you know that our bodies follow those things? Like my body has never said, I'm hungry, so I'm just going to go eat. My body responded, and I said, oh, that's good. So then my body went where my emotions and my, uh, my soul told it to go. Now the soul is made up of another three components, which is, which is my, my mind, my will, and my emotions. All of those things are who you are, regardless of whether you are aware of it or not, You function and you use it every single day. Some of you, you don't use them that well, but you do use them. Some of you, you are more reactors than responders. Some of you are more feelers than than those things. And, And so what happens is unless you know how you've been designed, how can you ever function in the way that God designed you, right? Because how many of you know we've all been taught certain ways of how we're emotional or or we shouldn't be emotional, or we should be feelers, or we shouldn't be feelers, right? Based on your family's past is determined how you probably are living right now, the health of your emotions. So this is the gist of it, is this, is look, the more, the less aware of you, of, of your emotions that you are, the less spiritual you'll be. Because God communicates through your emotions. If he didn't, he wouldn't have gave them to you. God gave you emotions for an opportunity for him to communicate to you because how many of you know emotions are what you become attached to the quickest, right? I mean, if somebody cuts you off, what do you do? We already know the Brianisms last year, right? That's what happens. How do you just immediately do that? It's called an emotion. Emotions are something that we are so closely connected to, whether we admit it or not. And so what God is trying to do here is he's trying to lay this thing out. He's trying to reveal this to us so that we can understand that this is how you were designed. And if you try to go outside of this design, you miss the whole aspect of who God is in your life. So here's this first point that I want you to understand, is this, is that emotions connect you with a God that gets you. you got to understand that God, God gets you. He understands how you function and how you tick. He gets it. He understands. He is, he is able to be connected with you because he gets you. I know a lot of other people don't get you, but God gets you. God understands you, and God, he he understands. Now, this is the deal. This is the difference between it. This is where the chasm meets. It's like where, it's where you don't get you. See, if you don't get you, you will never understand that God gets you. And a lot of us try to ignore the fact that we don't understand how we tick, and we want to push it away, and we want to say, oh, that's not how I am, but that is how you are. And until you op- open up and be honest with how you are, you will never see God in the way that he wants to show himself to you. Don't let it get so quiet in here. See, see this is what happens, is a lot of times, most of us are emotionally illiterate. We know our ABCs, we know our one, two, threes, but you don't know your emotions. This is what happens. So, as an illustration or an analogy, it would be like me, Jay Lee, you know, I come from a construction background where, you know, construction people, we don't have emotions. You know, we don't, we don't live that life, which is totally contrary to the reality is that a lot, that's why, that's why people get hammers thrown at them in construction or get shot with gun nails. You know, that's why, because we just react, bam, bam, bam. <laughs> it's the pent up emotion that we're told we're not supposed to have. So, so this is the scenario. This is why most of us or many of us are illiterate emotionally. Is this is what happens. So, so me, we'll do this, me and my wife, we have a daughter named Jaylee. And so what happens is as Jaylee's running down the sidewalk, we're out watching her run around, goof off a popsicle. She's just running down the sidewalk. She trips, she falls, she scrapes her knee, it's bleeding. 
what does daddy and mommy do? We run to her and be like, oh my gosh, what's wrong, baby girl? I scratched my knee and it's bleeding. I'm like, oh, let me kiss it. And Oh, that's so, you're so. Now, let's say we got Jake on the other hand. Jake is now Jake. Jaylee is now Jake. And, she, and she's a boy. And now he's running, a little boy, and he's running. We don't have a Jake in our family, but I'm just using it because it's close. And he's running down the sidewalk eating his popsicle, just having a great day. He falls. He scratches his knee. What does dad do? Hey, son, you're fine. Get up. It's just a little, let's put a little dirt on that and get the blood to stop bleeding. How many of you are part of that life? You've been there. So what happens is this, is that what we've been taught from our, our adolescence is that emotions are wrong if you're a guy. If you're a girl, then you can embrace them and you can have them and you can, oh, it's... Love stories and everything. But if you're a guy, you better not have emotions. You better not cry if you get hurt. So what happens is that we create a negative life, a negative light to emotions. And yet that is a third of who God created you to be, is to be an emotional being. And so we're living a life connected to a God, ignoring that part of who we are, wondering why we're not getting to meet God in the ways that we wish we could. Because we are disconnecting ourselves from a God who is a third emotion. Because he speaks to us through our spirit, but he speaks to us with emotion. This is how I know. Jesus, the man who is perfect, walks into a sanctuary, sees, oh, you're trading doves and all this, flips a table. That's called emotion. God made Jesus aware of emotion, and he flips the table and says, boy, you better stop. And then it goes into this next thing, and the biggest scripture, longest scripture of all of the Bible, and Jesus wept. Wept. Wept, that's an emotion. When's the last time that you've wept? When's the last time that you didn't press it down and refuse? Alicia, when I start crying, Alicia's like, are you crying? I'm like, seriously. I mean, she's like, get the magnifying glass. She's like, sure, you're crying. Right? Anybody else's wife does that to you? Like, if you would not highlight that, I might cry a little more. But, but then we go to the Garden of Gethsemane. So now we know that Jesus is he's got an assignment, it's to put his life on the cross, right? And he gets to the Garden of Gethsemane, and he says, if this cup can pass from me, let it be. What is happening? Emotion. He is saying, I do not want to do what I came to the earth to do, but not my will, but yours. And now what is he saying? He's showing you that emotion does not overpower your assignment if you will submit yourself to God. That it doesn't matter how you feel. In other words, you can be walking in your destiny and your purpose even though you don't feel like it. But because you are aware of the spirit of God on the inside of you, you say, God, that is what the enemy is trying to use to pull me away from my assignment. And so this is the power of emotions. That God created you to feel. To know and to have emotion. But we're told you can't do that. You, you shouldn't do that. Or we have an expectation on people to say you should respond like me. Or, or it should be this way. Instead of letting people learn, look, we are all emotional beings. Whether you want to say you're not, we, you know, you got those people, I, I don't, I'm not an emotional person. You are an emotional person, and you're unhealthy in your emotions. And some of you are like, I'm so emotional. Guess what? You're also emo- unhealthy in your emotions. Because some of us are so emotional that everything is emotional, we do. And then some of us, it's like whatever emotion we're feeling, we, we just refuse to press and we, you ignore God in doing that. So this is what happens. See, feeling and emotions close the gap from, our, from the perception, from our perception and our reality. How many of you know feelings can make you feel like it is reality? How many of you guys have ever had a feeling lie to you? How many of you have ever had a emotion of a friend who didn't see you in the grocery store while you were shopping and just, they're ignoring me. They're really not my friend. I knew it. No one's ever had that, right? No, you have, and you know it, and you know the reality of the power of emotions. And what did the feeling, and what did the emotion, it immediately told you, they're really not your friend. They saw you, and they didn't like you. See, what happens is when you become aware of your feelings and emotions, it closes the gap between a false perception and a real true reality. This is why you have to become aware of your emotions and your feelings so that you can sever between perception and reality. And until you do that, you are living in a false reality, calling it real, and it's not real. You think all of these people that you work with are not for you, yet you're unwilling to address the emotions in you to have a conversation that the emotions in you are telling you to have. 
And you will never be secure with a relationship until you have a conversation and your emotions are saying you need to talk. But what happens is our feelings are like they're going to reject me. That's an emotion. Just so you know, I remember learning this and I was like, oh my gosh, that's amazing. Did you know that anger is not a primary emotion? It's a secondary emotion. In other words, you're angry. Most of us say, ah, I'm angry. And it's not really, that's not why. That's not even the issue. The issue is something else made you angry, and we, ad- we use anger to express it. And we st- So we use anger to address the emotion instead of going to what made you angry. That's unhealthy. So what you have to do is say, okay, why did I get angry? Because a lot of us feel better after we throw a hammer or we do whatever we do. It's like, okay, that felt good. But you didn't deal with the emotion. You didn't deal with the disappointment. You didn't deal with the thing that hurt you and made you mad. Right? That's why Jesus, when he flipped the table, he didn't just flip it and walk away. He said, this is a place that should be used for prayer. You need to turn it back into a place of prayer. And he walked away. He said, okay, we will stop selling doves. (laughs) But had he just flipped the table and used an expression of anger, it would have done nothing for anybody. It didn't help him and it didn't help them. This is what we do a lot of times. We express anger. We think, okay, now that I've got it out, they know I'm mad. What do they know that you're mad about? So anger is, is, is this false sense of security. It creates a wrong perception. See, feelings and emotions drive 100% of our conversations. And it's amazing how we ignore them, yet they drive 100% of our conversations. You never just say, oh, I want to have a conversation just to have one. It is based on a feeling or an emotion. 100% of everything that you say is based on the health and the well-being of your emotional life. So what does that say? There are some things that you probably shouldn't be saying if you're unhealthy emotionally. Because you're having conversations, you're saying things that aren't lining up with necessarily the reality, but the perception. And so you're saying things that justify how you feel emotionally, but yet they're unhealthy, so you just say it because you feel it. Ask my wife. She'll tell you. <laughs> I'm trying to tell on myself, and you all aren't. It's okay. See, see, feelings influence the body. Have you ever had an emotion or a feeling, and then all of a sudden your body followed? When you see somebody that you're excited about seeing, what does your body do? Turns and goes towards them, opens your arms to hug, to shake, to kiss on the cheek, kiss on the lips, whatever it is. Better be your wife. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. Right? What, what happens is that once, once that emotion or whatever, that it influences the direction your life goes. So in this small situation, it addresses you may see someone you like. What do you do? You begin to move towards them. So this is the bigger side of it. What happens when you have an emotion or a feeling when it's about God's will for your life? Where do you move? based on the health of the emotion or the feeling and how you view God is for you or against you determines whether you're willing to move towards Him or away from Him. And I sense that there are a lot of people trying to run from God, not because God is not for them, but because you, don't, you have not been honest and open about the emotions that you feel towards the God that created you. And so God is saying, when will you begin to trust me? When will you begin to, begin to believe me? Not until you become honest with the emotions that are within you. And a lot of us are trying to do the will of God, and we're trying to really seek God's will for our lives, but we have not been honest with the fact that we might fail. Can I tell you what my biggest fail, my my biggest fear is? Failure. I remember going to a deal, and I called Alicia, I was like, they want me to figure out what's my biggest fear. And I wrote it down, but I didn't want to believe it. And I remember, because as a pastor, my biggest fear is to fail as a pastor. To, to, To desire to reach a city and to not do it. To, to desire to, to reach and disciple men and women for them to grow spiritually and for them to touch the, the hymn of God and to be able to know who he is and to not do it. That's my biggest failure. That's my biggest fear is to fail in doing that. And Alicia, as soon as she called me, she said, probably failure. I was like, dang it, I knew I was right. <laughs> but look, if I'm not honest with it, then I don't. I can't move on from it. And so many of us are trying to inno- ignore the emotion within us that God has designed for us to be able to be able to hear him and to know him, and we reject it and we refuse it. We're like, no, it's not failure. It's not failure. It's not failure. 
you can continue to push that away and ignore it, but it's like, it's like a rubber ball. You can bounce it off the wall, and it's coming right back at you. This is what we as believers, as Christians, have to understand. Look, you are not going to be healthy and grow mature, more mature just because you showed up to church on Sunday. I hate to break the news to you, but you're going to go into a family situation. You're going to go into a job situation. You're going to go into financial situations. And if you don't address those emotions there, it doesn't matter how much you raised your hands on Sunday. I know pastors aren't going to tell you this kind of stuff, but I want you to grow and I want you to mature and I want you to be honest with where you're at. You're going to grow by saying, you know what, I wonder if God's really like he's really a miracle, miracle worker. Okay, address that emotion. Why do you feel like he's not? Where did he let you down? Where do you feel he let you down? Where do you feel that he let somebody else down? And so because he let them down, I'm going to go ahead and take him as that. He's a God that fails. If you don't be honest with those things, you will never step in the direction that God has for your life. So, so just to back this up, I want to take you to, to a story in the Bible. Genesis chapter 2. See, see, emotions affect the heart, and the heart sets the course, whether you are moving toward God or away from Him. What does emotions do? They set the heart, right? That's why the Bible says to not trust the heart. The Bible says it lies. It can lie to you. Do you know what that means? That's like when you say you feel an emotion and you stuff it away and say, no, that's not. That's your heart lying to you. That's you not being honest with the emotion and the things that God created you with and saying, look, I'm going to ignore that. I'm going to stuff that down. I'm going to just act like that didn't happen. So in, in, uh, in Genesis chapter 2, it starts in verse 15. I'm going to read that and then go through 17. It says this, The Lord God placed the man in the Garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. But the Lord God warned him, You may freely eat the tree And the fruit of every tree in the garden, except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, you are sure to die. Now, for most of us, it's not in there, but the context of this scripture is actually, it says that the Bible, there were two trees, and they were set in the middle of the garden. And if you go to verse chapter 3, it'll it'll explain that here in just a minute. And it says that God set them in the middle of the garden. Now, If I'm God, and I want someone to not eat something, and to not be tempted by it, I would not set it in the middle of the garden. Like, I'm going to put it in the outer perimeters, in the backfield in the garden, where they probably aren't going to go very much. But God put the garden the way he did with the trees in the middle of the garden for a reason. And I'm going to share something with you this morning that I believe that if you get this, your life spiritually will be very different. So he sets them in there, and he puts them in the middle. And as, he's, as these guys are gardening, they're tending the garden, because that's what they did, right? The Bible says that they tended the garden. Every morning they would wake up, ah, oh, God is faithful. And every day they had to walk through the middle of the garden and see something that they weren't supposed to touch, that they weren't supposed to have anything to do with. Now, if you're a two-year-old and you're not supposed to touch something, what do you do? What is your... Okay, if you're a 45-year-old and you're told not to touch something, what do you do? You want to touch it. It is no different. I think we try to take the humanism out of Adam and Eve and be like, you know, I mean, yeah, duh, you're not supposed to touch the tree. How many of you put it in the garden would be like, duh, not supposed to touch the tree? None of you. Every one of you would be like, every time you walk by the tree, you'd be like, man, that tree, why does it have bigger fruit than every other tree? Why are they actually naturally shining like they've been buffed every morning? What is going on with that? It's taller, it's wider, it's got prettier bark, it's shiny. What is going on? See, this is what we do with our lives. All of us have a tree. All of us have something put in our lives that we're told not to touch. And what is the point of this tree? The point of this tree is to drive conversation. The point of this tree is for them to be able to have conversations with the God that created them so they could say, look, God, I really appreciate the trees. They're pretty to look at, but I got to know, why can't I touch it? Like, why why can't I just eat its lumptious fruit? Like, why can't I just 
Like when one falls, like, and it falls away from the tree, I didn't touch the tree. Can I just eat it? But most of us, we think that that we would just ignore the tree. But the reality is, is that what we do is we ignore our emotions about the tree. We know the tree's there, and we're told not to touch it. And we say, you know what, I know God says I'm not supposed to do that, so I'm just going to, but why, God? And I think a lot of us have a, but why, God? And we're unwilling to address the tree that's in the middle of our garden, in the middle of our life, that we're told we can't have access to, that we're not supposed to touch. And we walk by it, and we walk around it, and instead of it driving conversation and intimacy with the God that created you, it begins to separate you and divide you and think, God isn't really for me. I mean, I know he's provided a lot of stuff, but he will not let me touch that. And I can't believe he's robbing me from something that he created that I should be able to have. And this is what happens is it starts off small. No, no, I'm not supposed to touch that tree. Then it's, I can't believe God, you won't let me touch that tree. And then it begins to manifest and become something bigger because you're unwilling to address what's going on internally. You think this is what's happening. I'm going to show you biblically how I know that this is happening here in just a minute. But there are some things happening every morning that Adam and Eve wake up. There are some things that they're beginning to question God on. They're beginning to say, God, but the problem is, is they're not bringing their questions to the God that was designed for them to answer. So here's the point. Ignoring our feelings and emotions drive us away from, this rea- from the reality within us. There is a reality that is happening with Adam and Eve that they are going, because they're ignoring their emotions and their feelings, it is beginning to drive them away from their reality. Because the reality is every time they wake up, they see that tree and they wonder, why can't I have access to it? Like, what is it about that tree that I can't have? What is it about that relationship that I can't have? What is it about that job that I can't have? What is it about that school that I can't go to? What is it about that that I can't have? And if you continue to project your emotions internally and not address them, they will begin to be manifested. They will begin to expose themselves over the course of time. See, it's in the middle for a reason. He did that strategically for you and I to know, look, when you wake up in the morning and you have questions about that tree, come find me and let's have a conversation. Adam and Eve sits down. They say, God, look, our garden's beautiful. It's amazing. You've provided everything for us, but I got to know, what's it about this tree? And God says, oh, Adam and Eve, I've been waiting for you to ask me. That's why I put it there. Like, I was wondering when you were going to ask me. And I think God's waiting for you. The very same thing. And he's saying, look, this thing that I've told you you shouldn't touch, I've been waiting for you to have a conversation with me about. You've been waiting and wondering, and I've been waiting and wondering just when you would come and ask me. And now Adam and Eve, had they sat down with the God that created them, that they walked with, they would have left that conversation being reassured, oh, that's why, because if I do it, I'll know what sin's like, and God doesn't want me to have sin in my life. He doesn't want me to know that I should have shame or guilt. So he's actually been protecting me, but as long as you don't go and have a conversation, you begin to think God isn't for you, that he's robbing you and stealing from you instead of protecting you. And emotions will lie to you. Feelings will lie, and they'll drive up in the Uber and say, hey, want to ride? And you have to say no or yes. What's the fee? Always ask, what's the fee? You'd be like, I've been driving around all day in the Uber and my emotions and feelings, oh, that's $75. That's $300. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You didn't ask for the fee. And this is what we do, but if we would sit down with the God and have a conversation about some things that are going on internally, maybe God would bring some clarification and you would realize God's for you and not against you. It doesn't matter that the Bible says that. It doesn't matter that the Bible says that he is for you and not against you. God said that he, I mean, he walked with them. Yet they are walking by this tree every day, pinning up emotion and feelings of, God, you're not for me, or you would let me have it. Why would you rob me from that? Why would you take from me, God? See, let the tree bring you to a place that you're willing to have a strong, real, authentic conversation. And be honest with who you are. Be honest with what's inside. See, honesty may hurt first. It may hurt to maybe think, oh my gosh, God's going to not think that I really love him. 
or God's going to think I'm whatever it is. Honesty may hurt, but it will heal. If you will be honest with God, you will never, you will never have to wonder, and God will heal you in an area of honesty because God can't step into something that you're not willing to be honest with, even though he knows how you're really feeling. God doesn't. You are not robots. God created you as human beings in the image of God so that he could have conversation. As much of us say we're introverts, you are built relational. God created you to have relationships for the sole being of helping you know who your creator is. See, the tree was an opportunity to drive a conversation and intimacy to bring what? Clarity and, converse, and, and confirmation. Some of us, we don't have clarity of what's going on in our lives. It's not because God is a murky God. It's because we aren't willing to have a conversation with the real us inside. That we think God failed us. That we think God did this to us. And we think this, but that's the same scenario in Genesis 3, and 2 and 3. That Adam and Eve, every morning they wake up to tend the garden, to do the things that they've got to do. Every morning they have to walk by a big tree that says, do not touch. And they have to deal with what's going on inside of them. And look, I think for us, it would be ridiculous for us to think that we don't have a tree that says, do not touch. Not in this season. It's time you need to ignore this tree right now. You need to move on and trust me that I'm watching over you. There are some other people who need to be honest with their emotions that I feel lonely and I need to have a conversation with somebody. There's somebody that, that maybe you need to have some conversations with some relationships or some bosses or some, some people. And healing is only going to happen when you and I get honest with what's going on inside. Because at the end of the day, reality for you is what's going on inside, not what's going around outside. Whatever's going on inside is your reality. More was happening to Adam and Eve inside than what was happening to them outside. I will show you in a minute. See, the failure to be honest with what's happening internally only gives more power to Satan to influence you. The more dishonest you are with yourself gives the enemy more opportunity to influence you. Hey, you know, about that tree. What's going on? I'll tell you what's going on. God's trying to keep something from me. But had you had a conversation with God, the enemy lost his power as soon as you have a conversation with God. Right now, the enemy has influence over many of you this morning because you won't have a conversation with your wife. You won't have a conversation with your husband. You won't have a conversation with your kid. You won't have a conversation with your boss. You won't have a conversation with the teacher. You won't have a conversation. Emotions are healed by conversation. See, Going too long without addressing the emotions and feelings you have cause a negative perception, a false reality. And many of us are living and we're saying, look, this is, this is how it is. This is how God is. And you're living with a negative reality of who God is simply because you're unwilling to address the emotions and the feelings internally. God is going to, he's, he's not for me. He's against me. So I have this question that I want to ask you as we, as we move into this next thing. And I want you to write this down. I want this to be something that you tackle this year. Maybe you can answer it this week. And maybe it could take you a couple of weeks to answer it. But this is the question. What's your tree? And what conversations do you need to have with God? What's your tree? And what conversations do you need to have with God? Genesis 3, verse 1 says this. Now we're moving out from the tree. God designed it to now. We're in verse, verse 1 of chapter 3. The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat from the tree, from the fruit of, of any of the trees in the garden? Of course we may eat, from, eat fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. Notice that he knew what she could not touch. Notice she didn't mention the tree in the middle. He did. Right? Satan mentions to her about the tree in the middle of the garden. Why? Because he knew how she was feeling emotionally. He understood what was going on internally about how she felt about God keeping her from something. So he says, so hey, I heard that uh, you're not allowed to eat some trees in the garden. 
yeah, that middle one. <laughs> Let me just go ahead and vomit on you emotionally how I feel. That's what's happening here. And she says, of course we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. We, the woman replied, it's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God said, you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. Here's the point. Emotions set the direction your heart moves. Check this out. So, so emotions set the direction your heart moves. In one moment, her heart is for God. She's walking with God. And in a moment of one conversation with this person, this enemy, this snake, this serpent, whatever it is, which we know it's Satan, in one conversation, everything changes. Why? It wasn't the power of the conversation. It was the power of what was inside of her that she was unwilling to address. Here's the, here's the thing. You can walk with God and still not believe that he is for you. You can walk with God. Some of you may have been walking with God for two months, five years, ten years, twenty years. But just because you've walked with God does not, does not mean that you believe he is really for you. They were walking with God in person, walking next to God, the one that created him, in the cool of the day, yet did not believe that God was for them. Thought that God was robbing them from something simply because they saw something that they were unwilling to address internally and say, you know what, I'm going to walk with him, but I'm not going to ask him about this, how I really feel. And so, to their demise, became our demise. And let me just say this, your unwillingness to address emotions and feelings don't just affect you. Your unwillingness to, 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 uh, to address emotions and feelings, they, they, it is collateral damage or collateral blessing. See, unaddressed emotion causes you to become vulnerable and decide with sources that aren't for you. You guys, check this out. Adam and Eve have been walking cool of the day with God. Man, God, you, this is amazing. Look at our garden, tree. Maybe we don't know how long that issue was. It could have been a week, could have been months, could have been years. I don't know. It doesn't necessarily say. But we do know there was time involved for some things to happen. And it says that she had one conversation. How do you go from walking with a God every day to in one single conversation siding with someone you know, how do you do that? How do you fall prey to something like that? You fall prey to something like that because it was already in you. It was already there. So what he did is all he did was confirm the emotions and feelings and gave her a right to be vindicated and to think that God is not for me. I told you, Adam. I told you. I told you, Eve. You know, it's this constant battle between... I knew, I knew that he wasn't for me. Did you hear what he said? He's trying to keep it from us so we would be like him. I knew it. I walked by every day thinking, and the more that you do that, the more that what that lie is, is it becomes your reality. And now in a moment, someone who she was once walking with every day now becomes the, becomes the person that is her enemy because of what she was unwilling to address internally. And there are many of us this morning, we've been walking with God and we've been ignoring the emotions and the feelings about how God has let us down, how we didn't think we would be where we were at. And until you get real with the tree in your life, you will constantly be susceptible to the influence of the enemy over your life. Until you're willing to say, not today, devil. I had a conversation this morning that tells me that's something different. And you've got to be willing to have some emotional conversations with the God, not with your friends or your family. Have them with God first, and then talk to whoever you need to talk with.